Okay, why don't we get started so that we will not run out of time. We won't go over it, by the way. That was uh, an exception on Monday just uh, because we had to get stuff working here. Um, so not, not to worry, the class will end on time. Um, for some reason, the I think it's working now, so um, you will have this lecture not only as a PDF, but also as a video. But for some reason, the Monday one, um, I'm sorry, at least my part of it, didn't record. So you don't uh, have the video for that, but you have the PDF. And if you have questions about it, of course, ask your TAs or uh, email me. Uh, so we're going to uh, start with a sort of gross anatomy of the brain, uh, mostly fairly macroscopic at this point, and then next week you will get into more microscopic details looking at neurons and their components. But today we're basically going to look at the human brain, and then on Thursday there's the first discussion section, um, so tomorrow um, afternoon, and you'll get to see a real human brain and hold it if you like. The sections, I just looked at them uh, right before this class, are, so basically there's one thing that needs to be done in order to equalize the number of people in the different discussion sections, which is quite straightforward. I need five people to switch from section two, which is the one from three to four p.m., into section four, from four to five p.m. Um, so we could try this right now. Are there five people who know that, who are in section two, from three to four, who would be able, to, able and willing to switch into section four? or who is able? Could you put your hands up? One, two, I got two. Uh, any, anybody else? Just to reiterate this, is there anybody else here who's in section two currently? Hopefully you know which section you're in, from three to four, who is able to switch into four or five. Okay, we got, so one, two, three. Did you already put your hand up before? Just put, raise your hands high so I can see who you are. One, two, three. Okay, two more people. Anybody else? Okay, so if you three could switch, um, and then let's see how it looks. I mean, it'll be better. Um, yes? Is this like, can you use an add a dot card and switch sections? That's a good question. Um, does anybody know how to, how to switch sections? Do you do an add and yeah, a drop so and add, add or something? Add a drop card, you can use the drop section. Okay, so basically you have to drop the previous section and add the new one is how it seems to work. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so maybe if the three of you could check uh, with John right after. And if there's anybody else able, uh, that basically that specific formula will fix it. Then all the sections will have about seven or eight people and will be good. Um, I don't have office hours this Sunday, and actually not the following Sunday either, because I'm out of town. Um, so if you have a question, I mean, next week, Professor Lester will take over and is going to be vastly more expert than I am anyway. But this week, you well may have some questions about my lectures, or you may just want to talk to me about the course in any case. Um, the, easy, the best by far is to email me. Email me, we'll set up a time, I'm quite flexible, including weekends and late at night, and that's the best way to contact me rather than uh, office hours right now because I'm gone the next two Sundays. Any questions on the, on the logistics? Discussion sections tomorrow, remember they're required. Um, and uh, if these folks who raised their hands could switch as indicated. The reading you will note, and in particular, if you look at the reading for next week, you'll see that there's not just page numbers, but whole chapters assigned to you. The reading will accelerate, and as I mentioned on Monday, it's a dense course, so definitely don't fall behind. Uh, if you want to go ahead and read ahead, that's great. You can, you can do so. Um, but don't fall behind. Make sure you do the readings prior to the lecture, 
and ideally take a look at the PDFs of the lecture. If you're able to print them out and take longhand notes, uh, psychological studies have shown that your memory consolidation for the material that you learn in the class will be optimized by that mechanism. So you can choose to do so. Um, any questions on what we have in store for this week? We had the intro, the intro, which was very brief. On Monday, today we'll go over anatomy and then development, uh, and it will get more dense quickly. Okay, so what we're going to go over today is um, an overview of the brain, uh, some brief comparisons, evolution. We already saw a little bit of that on Monday. Some terms, there are a bunch of terms that you will need to learn in this class, um, so make sure that you know them. We'll go over those today, mainly in terms of um, orienting yourself with respect to the anatomy of the brain and sections through it. We'll go over the growth structure of the nervous system, the pathways, uh, the different parts of the brain, the different lobes and what's in them, and then uh, conclude with a brief overview of different methods that are used to study the nervous system and their uh, relative advantages and disadvantages. So we had this last time, but ran out of time. And so um, one main point is that the complexity of the human brain, which nobody knows how to quantify, but however you want to guess at that, vastly exceeds the information that can be explicitly encoded, encoded in the genome. So as you know, there's only about 20,000 or so protein coding genes in the human genome. Some plants have more than that. And so there's a very loose relationship between the number of genes and the complexity of the brain. That's not to say that the genes don't play a role. Of course they do, but the role that they play is very indirect. And in particular, the spatial and temporal expression of genes at particular points in time and development in particular parts of the brain results in the, in the development of the brain, something that we'll look at on Friday, such that it learns information and uh, forms patterns, interacts with the environment, and results in the complex final product that you all have in your skulls. Uh, but so just to keep going through this exercise here, so the number of distinct neuronal phenotypes, by contrast, is quite large. So it's not clear quite how to um, distinguish different neuronal phenotypes, but you could do so on the basis of morphology, the, sh the shape that cells have, their um, uh, projection to other parts of the brain and uh, the kinds of neurotransmitters that they use. And so you could identify, and, and one way of identifying them would be just by the complement of genes that they express. Uh, at any rate, however you want to calculate this, there's, there's a much larger number than for any other tissue in your body. So, you know, if you take a look at, say, the liver, the liver has four cell types. And, you know, there's not too much complexity. Uh, the skin has somewhat more, but it's not, none of the other organs uh, approach this uh, number. There's actually a Wikipedia entry for something like a um, number of different cell types in the adult human body that lists all the different cell types, all, all the different organs. And in the case of the brain, you will see there's entries with little parentheses that typically say, not fully understood. So um, there's a lot of work uh, still to be done. There are about 85 billion neurons in the adult human brain. That's about the same as the number of glial cells, um, which also do a lot of work, but uh, to some extent do less of the immediate sort of computational information processing than do the neurons. They, it's not that they don't do anything, but uh, they, they serve somewhat different functions. Uh, so, and this is a revision from what people used to think. People used to, have, uh, used to think there were many more glia than neurons. That seems not to be the case. Each of these has a thousand or so connections with other neurons. So the number of connections in the adult human brain is about 10 to the 14. And so if you ask what kinds of patterns of networks could you generate with that, so it's, it's sparsely connected. Not, none of, so if you have an 85 billion by 85 billion matrix, they're not, all, not all neurons are connected with all others. It's very, very sparse. Uh, but nonetheless, you have a huge number of different ensembles that can be generated by this. So it's the pattern of neurons that are causally interconnected with one another that process information in your brain that uh, underlies all of cognition and uh, behavior. So it can generate a lot of those. There's lots of complexity there. And then, of course, 
uh, philosophers have been uh, fond of pointing out that it sure seems like the number of different thoughts or conscious experiences that you could have seems unbounded. Obviously not infinite, since you don't live forever, but it doesn't seem like you're suddenly going to run out and say, oh, you know, I've had you know, 100 billion experiences so far, and now uh, I have to start having some of the same ones again because I don't have enough distinct patterns of activity in my brain. Uh, there's obviously something wrong with that. Does anybody know why, indeed, you could have an unbounded number of experiences in, in, your, in your brain? This is the easy answer. Well, your brain is not static. So whatever the connections are in your brain, they're changing all the time. So given that there's learning and memory and plasticity and your brain is continuously changing, uh, of course there's no bound. Um, there's just a couple of other facts. Again, these were from the lecture on Monday, um, but we didn't have time for them. This is just the number of neurons under a cubic millimeter of cortex, typically. It varies depending on exactly where you are in the brain. Um, these are just various little factoids. One main one to emphasize is that if you look at this cubic millimeter, these 20,000 or so neurons that are under that, the amount of act, the uh, length, if you just try to stretch out the length of axons, axons are processes of neurons by which they connect to other neurons, it's enormously long, four kilometers. And this just drives home the point that even though it's, very, it's a very sparse connectivity between these 85 billion neurons, they, some of them need to make very long-range projections. For instance, neurons in your motor cortex project all the way, some of them project all the way down to the spinal cord. Uh, some neurons on the left hemisphere have to cross and go over to the right hemisphere. So that's a fairly long distance. Most of your brain, most of the volume of your brain, is not composed of cell bodies, but is composed of the processes that connect neurons, so-called white matter, that we'll take a look at in a minute. Um, okay, so, um, so one, uh, and I'll, we'll have various um, slides throughout, uh, most of which, maybe not all of which, will have little boxes around them, but so these are things that are little snippets that you should uh, memorize. They're good candidates, for instance, for appearing on a quiz. Remember that at some point this week, there will be a quiz on uh, the uh, stuff that you've had so far, and likewise for subsequent weeks. So uh, information is encoded in the wiring of the brain, and a lot of this, we'll see this on Friday, depends on experience. How neurons connect to one another depends on many different factors, but a lot of the details in your adult brain depend on, um, on experience. Earlier on in life, when, you, when there isn't much experience, how neurons connect to one another depends less on experience. Um, and we saw this last time. So human brains are unusually large. They have a very large encephalization quotient. If you look at the regression between brain size, brain volume, and body size across different species, you find that the residual of that for humans is very large. Our, lar our brains are much larger than you would predict given our body size. Um, newborn brains are actually unusually small uh, in relation to what you would find in other primate species. So they're unusually small in relation to the size of the adult brain. Uh, so a baby, a human baby brain is about 25% the size of an adult brain. By comparison, a chimpanzee, a baby chimpanzee brain at birth is about already 50% of its adult size, and the baby monkey brain is close to 70% of its adult size. One consequence of that is that humans, relative to these other, other primate species that I mentioned, are relatively more immature, more altricial at birth, than are apes and monkeys, who are relatively more precocious. So a baby monkey, when it's born, can do a lot more and do things a lot more quickly and move around and interact with the world, whereas a human baby, as you know, can't do too much yet. It takes a while, and of course, full development of cognition and behavior takes, you know, decades, right? So um, there's a very, very prolonged period of human brain development um, that uh, depends on interaction with the environment, and in particular, the social environment. Okay. There's a, if you look across um, phylogeny, and hence, presumably, to some extent, also evolution, um, there are a couple of uh, very coarse, sort of noteworthy inventions. Myelin, which is the um, uh, 
the matter that wraps around, we'll take a look at it in, in a minute, that wraps around axons to insulate them and to allow more rapid conduction of action potentials is found in vertebrates. Invertebrates uh, don't have this. Um, so squid, for instance, uh, don't have myelin. They've solved the, quest, the problem of how to more rapidly conduct action potentials between regions that are spatially far apart by just having very large diameter um, axons. You'll hear more about that from Henry Lester's lectures. So there's, there's giant, they're often very large, giant axons. In fact, the giant axon of the squid led to a lot of electrophysiological insights because it was so amenable to electrophysiology because it was very big. But by comparison, vertebrates tend to have much smaller axons and instead to conduct information between spatially different parts, they, they have this wrapped in myelin. So that's another reason why you have so much white matter in your brain. It's not just all these axons, but it's all the myelin in which they are wrapped in order to enable efficient and rapid conduction of action potentials that occupy so much space in your brain. It's only with the evolution of mammals that neocortex arose. You saw a brief picture of that last time. It's all of uh, uh, this uh, very outer part, outer wrinkly part of your brain where there are cell bodies. And this arose with the evolution of mammals. So for instance, birds and reptiles uh, don't have that. They have myelin, but they don't have neocortex. Um, other things that arose, the connection between the left and right hemispheres that's very big and prominent in your brains, the corpus callosum. This is what's sectioned, uh, used to be sectioned in people with severe epilepsy and resulted in so-called split brain patients that Roger Sperry once studied here at Caltech. We'll talk more about Roger Sperry on Friday in the context of other studies that he did in development. But this big white matter connection that connects the left and right cerebral hemispheres, which has about 200 million axons, arose with the evolution of placental mammals. So marsupials like kangaroos and opossums do not have that. They have neocortex, they have myelin, but they don't have the corpus callosum. And then there are a variety of other um, inventions that we, we won't go into in any detail right now uh, that uh, seem to have arisen uh, with the evolution of uh, primates. Parts of the brain, like for instance parts of the prefrontal cortex, seem to have expanded disproportionately in the evolution of primates. Certain kinds of neurons seem to be found in primates, maybe some other species. But all of this to say that what one story eventually that we would like to be able to say something about is what it is that distinguishes the behavior and the cognition of primates and indeed of humans from that of other species. Well, it has to have something to do with the differences in the brains. Exactly what that is, is, is a very complex question. There are many, many different inventions that arose throughout evolution that all enable what it is that your brain does. Being big is one of those, but it's certainly not the only thing. How does your ner nervous, how does the central nervous system look? So here's the nervous system uh, seen from the outside. So if you just took the brain, spinal cord, and the beginnings of the nerves that come off the spinal cord, it would look like this. And one uh, thing to point out here, as we'll see in just a minute, is that this is all ensheathed in a, in a series of uh, membranes. So the brain and the spinal cord all actually float in a thick kind of bag, uh, a series of membranes that are filled with fluid. We'll take a look at that in just a second. But one main point to make here is that the nervous system is, of course, much more than your brain. So a brain, your brain is uh, the largest single part of the nervous system. During development, it looks uh, much more similar. But then one thing that happens during development is that the forebrain here really expands and thickens and proliferates in your case. But the spinal cord and all the nerves going out to your body, to your fingers, to your toes, also constitute, of course, part of your nervous system. So the nervous system as an organ is actually extremely complicated and you know, like a big tree with lots and lots of branches that uh, are everywhere in your body. So every, everywhere on your skin that you need to sense something, all the muscles that you need to be able to move, all the nerves going down to your heart, to your digestive tract, etc., are all part of your nervous system. Uh, so it's spread out in, in a very complicated way. Here's how it looks in an MRI scan. Uh, this weird little thing down here is an uh, MRI of a heart beating. 
just to make the point that you can take nice MRIs, of course, of many structures in your body. But so what this shows here is just a cross-section in the human head and neck and upper torso where you can see part of the central nervous, part of the, part of the nervous system. So here's the brain, here's the spinal cord, and then you can see a little bit of nerves uh, going out from there. So quickly going through some of the nomenclature. So the central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord. So if you have neurons that are in the spinal cord, if you have neurons in the brain, that's the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is uh, everything else. So it's fairly easy. So if you have nerves that are outside the brain and spinal cord, those are part of the peripheral nervous system. So nerves that go out to your legs, uh, in your fingers, for, for touch, um, and so forth, are all part of the peripheral um, nervous system. And these arise uh, uh, differently during development. There are different diseases that affect uh, these, um, and so forth. So there's a variety of, of differences. They're both part of the nervous system. They're connected with one another, but they're different, uh, different partitions of it. These words here, afferent and efferent, mean uh, input to, that's afferent, or output from a certain structure. So if you have afferents to the thalamus, then we're talking about axons coming in and projecting into the thalamus, whereas efferents from the thalamus would be projections out from the thalamus to other brain structures, for instance. The autonomic nervous system, which is something that we'll talk about only later in the lecture on emotion, um, is a, a particular part of the nervous system that is functionally um, defined, and it consists of both central and peripheral components, uh, and it's by, by uh, distinction to the somatic nervous system. So the somatic nervous system controls all voluntary movement, when I move muscles, uh, speak, um, and so forth. Um, but the autonomic nervous system controls uh, smooth muscle and organs. So, for instance, there are projections from the brain to your blood vessels that control blood pressure. There are projections to the heart that control how rapidly the heart pumps blood. And these are all part of the autonomic nervous system. One function, as we'll see when we talk about emotion much later in the course, of the autonomic nervous system is to be able to coordinate all of these uh, responses, for instance, when you're in an emotional state. So if you're afraid, then you know, your eyes will dilate, uh, your digestion will stop, there will be blood flow to your big muscles in your legs, your heart will accelerate, and those are all coordinated, and those are all uh, coordinated by the autonomic nervous system. White matter, I just mentioned to you, is made up of myelinated axons, and that's why it looks white. It has a lot of cholesterol in it, a lot of lipids. Gray matter is cell bodies. So one very important distinction, very basic distinction, is that white matter are the connections, the axons, often myelinated between different neurons, and gray matter are the cell bodies. These are distributed in a fairly clumped way, which is why when you look grossly, without a microscope even, at a human brain, you can see white matter and gray matter. They're big, big tracts of white matter where there's, where there's axons that are all bundled together, and there are regions of gray matter, like cerebral cortex, neocortex, that we already mentioned on the outside of the brain, uh, that are all arranged uh, together as well. And then myelin, we already mentioned. Um, a ganglion, plural ganglia, is a group of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, and the nucleus is the equivalent in the central nervous system. So you already now know of three uh, different um, names for uh, regions in the brain where you could have cell bodies. One is cerebral cortex, that's gray matter. One is ganglia, that's also gray matter, but it's in a very particular place. It's outside in the peripheral nervous system. And the other one is nuclei, like the thalamus or the amygdala, which is also gray matter. But, it's, but none of these are are cortex, so they're just clumps, collections of cell bodies, but they're not arranged in the particular way that the cell bodies in cortex are arranged on the surface of your brain. A nerve is a bundle of axons in the peripheral nervous system, and in the central nervous system, these are called tracts. So the corpus callosum that I just mentioned technically would be called a tract, it would be the largest white matter tract in the human brain. 
Uh, sulcus, plural sulci, are the little folds, the valleys, uh, that you will see if you look at the outside of a brain. So if you look at neocortex in a human brain, uh, like we saw on Monday, and we'll take a look at it again in just a minute here, it's very foldy, so the surface area to volume ratio is very large, so that you can pack a lot of neocortex into the brain. So I'll, I'll fold it up, about the size of a large pizza, if you have flattened it. And the little folds, the valleys going in, are called south side, and the um, evaginations, the little hills, are called uh, gyri. Okay, so here's the brain. So you can, you're looking down at cortex, at neocortex of the human brain here. And indeed, right here would be a gyrus, where my pointer is. That's a gyrus. Next to it, this little fold down in here would be a sulcus. What they've done here is removed a bunch of things so that you can see the brain, but they haven't removed everything. So you're not actually looking directly at the surface of the brain. They've removed the scalp and the hair, of course. They've taken a bone saw and opened and taken the, the skull away. And they've folded back these big flaps that you can see here that look sort of like leather of a particular membrane called the dura. But you'll see that there's still this kind of cellophane-like stuff stuck to the surface of the brain. And we'll see this in the discussion sections on uh, Thursday, tomorrow, as well. And this is yet another membrane. So you'd have to peel this back, which gets much more difficult to do, to really actually get at the surface of the brain. And that's show all the different layers are shown down here. So let's take a look at these in a little more detail. These different layers of membranes that ensheath the brain are called the meninges. And then uh, we'll also take a look at what's inside the brain. If you go uh, very far into the middle, it turns out there are these hollow cavities that are filled with fluid that are called ventricles. So we already saw the nervous system briefly, and you remember it looked really weird, like kind of like in a, uh, in a bag. So if you just take the brain out of the skull, it would look like this. And it would be inside here, but it's in a bag. It's a very thick, tough membrane called the dura. And inside that, there's fluid. So it's a fluid-filled bag that in fact it goes all the way down uh, the spinal cord. So the brain and a narrower version of, of, of this uh, all going all the way down the spinal cord are all wrapped in this very thick, tough membrane, the dura, which is filled with fluid. Um, underneath that, if you go from the dura down to the next uh, um, membrane, is the arachnoid, and that's kind of more leathery like this. Um, it's closely associated, it's closely stuck to the dura, and it's underneath that that you have cerebrospinal fluid, this fluid that bathes the brain in which it kind of floats, and blood vessels. So if you go from the outside to the inside, you would go, you know, from the scalp to the skull to the dura, that really thick membrane, the arachnoid, and then you'd hit a bunch of fluid. So that's where the actual fluid is. And then if you go even further underneath the fluid and right on top of the brain is the final of these three membranes called the pia, which is really kind of thin. And in fact, it's impossible to remove without damaging the surface of the brain. Okay, so you have three membranes. The dura, which is really, really thick, and that's what you would see outside and completely opaque, so you can't actually see the brain if there's the dura on top of it. Right underneath that, the arachnoid. Underneath that, there's a space, the subarachnoid space, that's filled with fluid, cerebrospinal fluid. And then in that floats the brain, covered by one last membrane that's really stuck right to the surface of the brain and goes right down into the grooves of the salt side, which is the pia. All right? So where does this fluid come from that I've been talking about? Well, if you take a cross-section of a brain, it turns out that there are these hollow... Um, cavities inside called ventricles. There's two lateral ventricles. There's a third ventricle. There's connections between them. There's the fourth ventricle. And then there's various openings called foramina through which uh, the fluid in these cavities, in these ventricles, can then flow from inside the brain and the ventricles to outside the brain underneath the arachnoid and bathe the whole brain and spinal cord. So there's where is it made? It's made inside here. So it starts inside. It's made in this weird, by this weird purple structure here, um, of which there's not very much. In a couple of places by the ventricles, it's called the choroid plexus. 
And this secretes about 500 milliliters of this fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, per day. This fluid is secreted, so there's pressure that builds up here in these ventricles. It goes down, it then leaks out, and then it covers the entire brain. So it's kind of schematized here. So you would have cerebrospinal fluid made. Uh, it's secreted half a liter a day by choroid plexus. It starts in places like the third ventricle, goes to the lateral ventricle, and flows around these cavities that are inside the brain. Then eventually it flows out through a foramenum here, foramen, and then it would bathe the entire outside of the brain in this space that is between the arachnoid and the pia, so this whole green stuff here is the cerebrospinal fluid, and bathe the brain and indeed the spinal cord all the way down. Any questions about this basic arrangement? What's this for? Um, that's a good question. Um, it probably serves a number of functions. It, this, it actually it keeps secreting, and it actually has a fairly high turnover, so it tur turns over about three times a day. There's, uh, there's some ionic composition to this cerebrospinal fluid. It's very rich in bicarbonate ions um, that probably serves some function. It helps to clear away uh, things, pr proteins, um, and so forth. Um, it's one of the things that you that you get, actually, if you get a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture. So if, there, if you're sick or if there's bleeding inside the brain, etc., you will find that in the cerebrospinal fluid. It'll leak all the way down to the lumbar portion of your spinal cord, which is where you take it away. So to some extent, it helps clear away metabolites. It also, by bathing the entire brain, it also serves to some extent to cushion the brain from shock. So there are probably a number of functions. Um, it comes with a bit of a cost because since it's always being secreted here, it turns out that you can, if it's blocked somewhere, it turns out you can get abnormal pressure building up inside here in the condition called hydrocephalus that, we, that you saw in one of the brains I showed you on Monday. Um, so just to make that point here, so here it would, so the cerebrospinal fluid is made inside the brain, fills the ventricles, leaks out, breaks the entire brain, the spinal cord, and the dura, and the arachnoid, so these really thick membranes underneath which the cerebrospinal fluid is, covers the brain, the spinal cord, and indeed it goes down and continues after the spinal cord ends. So if you go down from the brain to the foramen magnum, where the spinal cord goes down inside the vertebral column, the spinal cord, remember, is part of the central nervous system. There's lots of processing going on in the spinal cord. We'll take a brief look at it in the lectures on the um, somatosensory and motor systems, but the spinal cord stops sort of halfway, two-thirds down your back. All the nerves emanating from it keep going down, and so there's this big thing here called the cauda equina, or horse's tail, that goes down in, the in your lower back, lower part of your spinal cord, lower part of your spine, that no longer has a spinal cord in it, and it's just a big bundle of nerves. This is still ensheathed, so this whole thing is ensheathed in a big, thick bag of dura and arachnoid and filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Is this place down here, where you do a lumbar puncture, aka spinal tap, so you can come in with a syringe and you can tap the cerebrospinal fluid and you can see if it has a normal ionic composition and seems pretty clear, or this abnormal metabolites, some sign of infection or blood or something else uh, in it, which is taken for clinical purposes. But the reason they do it here is that there's no risk of damaging the spinal cord and rendering you paraplegic um, because the spinal cord has ended there. But there's still cerebrospinal fluid. And here is just a, a sort of transparent view of the ventricles. So it's two lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, the fourth ventricle, they're all connected. And then there's the central canal which is right in the middle of the spinal cord that continues on down. And in addition, there are these openings through which the cerebrospinal fluid leaks out and covers the brain. Any questions about this basic arrangement? So it's um, strange, but that's how it is. Uh, one um, explanation for why this looks as it does comes from development, and we'll take a look at this on Friday, which is that early on, your nervous system forms as a tube. And so there's a tube that forms very early on, the neural tube, and parts of that then differentiate to form all the different anterior, posterior, and so forth, dorsal, ventral parts of the nervous system. So what, originally, it begins as a tube, 
And these ventricles and the central canal and their spinal cord are simply the, the center of that tube that's very early in development. And then later on in development, this part of the tube greatly expands and proliferates and forms your brain. But it starts as just a simple tube. So that's, that's the sort of embryological origin of uh, why you have the ventricles. Remember, we saw this brain, of, or in a more extreme version of it, on Monday. So if you have a blockage somewhere in one of these foramina, one of these openings, where cerebrospinal fluid can come out from the ventricles and go into the subarachnoid space, pressure will build up in the brain, and you will get really, really dilated, huge ventricles. So this can sometimes happen early in development, and you can get end up with a brain that's like this. And if it's typically, if it's not treated, it would kill you, and you have to put in a shunt of some kind so that the cerebrospinal fluid can flow through that region that's obstructed. Um, there's one uh, quick important point to make. You will hear uh, more about this, I think in particular from Henry Lester's um, lectures. There's one one very important fact to keep in mind about the blood vessels in the brain, uh, which is that they have unusual um, specializations, tight junctions that prevent uh, molecules from sort of indiscriminately passing from your blood into the brain. This is a good thing. If you eat something that's toxic, uh, you might not want toxins, you might not want bacteria, and you know lots of things that could be bad for you to get into your brain. On the other hand, it also poses a problem, which is that, well, you do need to get stuff from the blood into your brain, like glucose. And so, um, the, why there's, on the one hand, there's this blood-brain barrier that prevents mole large molecules from indiscriminately passing from the blood into your brain. On the other hand, there are a whole bunch of specialized transport mechanisms that do allow some molecules to pass into the brain. This is one main challenge for um, for um, pharmacology clinically. So if you want to get drugs into the brain, it's often quite difficult to do. You can't just design any kind of a drug and put it in there because it won't cross the blood-brain barrier. That's something that you need to pay attention to. People first notice this when they put dye into, um, into animals uh, and looked at the cadavers. And if you put, uh, inject dye into the bloodstream, you can stain all the various organs with a dye, but the brain will remain unstained because these dye molecules don't pass through the blood-brain barrier. A couple of more terms in terms of orientation. So here's a human brain. Anterior is towards the front, like where your eyes would be, so that's over here. Posterior, caudal, is towards the back, back of your head. Down is ventral, up is dorsal. So here you're looking at the left uh, hemisphere of a human brain. We'll take a look at some of the different subdivisions of it in just a second. What happens to this kind of axis of anatomical orientation here, anterior, superior, posterior, ventral, um, as you go down the spinal cord? Well, you just simply flip that axis as you go down uh, in the spine. So posterior now becomes uh, back here, dorsal becomes towards your back, ventral, anterior, is towards the front, okay? If you take a section through the brain, this is called a horizontal section, then it would look like what's shown here. So again, you can see, even without any staining, the white and the gray matter. So white matter, remember, are all these myelinated axons, which is why it looks white, full of lipids. That's mostly in the middle of the brain here. And then there's gray matter, certainly cortex, so we have a cortex that you see on the outside, and I can't see it very well from here, but you will, you will also see various nuclei, probably parts of the basal ganglia and so forth, thalamus, um, in the middle here. So a horizontal cut has bilateral symmetry. The left and the right sides of the brain are bilaterally symmetric if you do a horizontal cut to first order. Turns out they are very subtle asymmetries, for instance, having to do with the specialization for language processing that's lateralized to the left, that you can see reflected in the anatomy, but you wouldn't see them with the naked eye. So to first order, uh, this section has symmetry, as does a coronal cut. So a coronal cut is like this, or you could tilt it slightly, it would still be called coronal, so from top to bottom. And uh, so, sorry, here's the brain in a coronal section, 
Again, you can see white matter, you can see gray matter, you can see cut in cross-section the horns of the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, so these cavities inside the brain that are filled with cerebrospinal fluid that we just spoke about. And then down here, the spinal cord. Again, this has bilateral symmetry. Or you can have a sagittal cut, which is a cut right along the midline, and that does not have bilateral symmetry. So if you cut the brain right along the midline, it looks like this. Here's the anterior part of the brain, the front. Here's the posterior part of the brain on the back. We've caught this big tract, the largest white matter tract in the human brain, the corpus callosum, here in cross-section, as we have also caught in partial cross-section the third ventricle filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Here's the cerebellum, which is a part of the central nervous system that we don't have time to talk about. Uh, it's certainly involved in balance and motor coordination, and people used to think that that was its only or primary function. It's now clear it does many, many things, um, including cognitive functions. Uh, and then here is the pons and brain stem. So this is a sagittal cut. If you're slightly off the midline, so if we cut the brain just a little bit over into the right hemisphere or the left hemisphere, we would have, but parallel to this uh, plane, we would have a parasagittal cut. Again, here's the corpus callosum that you would see in cross-section with a sagittal section. And the different parts of the corpus callosum have different names that are shown here. Um, any questions about the sort of basic orientation and big anatomy of the brain? So take a look at these slides, take a look at the figures in your book, and make sure that you familiarize yourself with these so that when we talk about a coronal section, you know what it is that we're talking about. Uh, there are lots of inputs and outputs of the central nervous system. Of course, all the um, other nerves that come out of the spine are a big part of that. But in addition, there are nerves that don't come out of the spine, but that come that are, that are cranial nerves. So the nerves, for instance, that connect your eyes to the rest of the brain, um, optic nerve number two, or olfactory nerve number one, Nerves that control eye movements, like these three here. Uh, nerves concerned with touch and pain from the face, the trigeminal nerve, auditory nerve. So we'll he uh, you'll hear a lot about these uh, in the lectures on particular systems. But these are all uh, ways in which the brain is connected with uh, uh, structures that have typically, for all of these ones, this is all concerned with interfacing with the world, either through these sensory nerves, like the optic or the olfactory, or through nerves that can move uh, sensing structures like your eyes, like these ones that control eye movement. You don't need to memorize these, but you just need to know that there are 12 cranial nerves uh, in addition to the many nerves that come out of the spine. Let's take a look at the, diff at the subdivisions of the brain. So you need to know where these are. You should be able to draw a pic rough picture on the board of a human brain and be able to tell me where the four lobes are and what the main anatomical boundaries are. So there's four big lobes, the frontal lobe, that is the largest in the human brain, just behind it the parietal lobe, the most posterior, the occipital lobe, and kind of more ventrally and just anterior to the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe. So these are different lobes that uh, have cortex and then also centrally all the other structures and uh, white matter in them. They do different kinds of things, as we'll talk about in just a second. There's a big um, sulcus here, this blue thing, called the central sulcus, that divides the frontal and the parietal lobe. And there's another big sulcus here, called the sylvian fissure, that divides the temporal lobe from the overlying parietal and frontal lobe. So you need to know these two, the central sulcus in blue, the sylvian fissure, which is this sort of red thing that I'm tracing here. And then you have the cerebellum and the brainstem. Um, just for fun, this is um, uh, the amount by which you would have to magnitude um, to enlarge or expand a monkey brain in order to warp it into a human brain. And when you try to align, I mean, you can do it not perfectly, but to some extent, you can align, you can co-register different parts of the monkey brain to the corresponding parts of a human brain. And so the amount of expansion to warp a monkey into a human brain is not uniform everywhere, but certain parts of the brain need to be inflated a lot more. And very roughly, this corresponds to those parts of the brain that during evolution 
have enlarged disproportionately in humans as compared to monkeys. And it's kind of what you might expect. Um, so certainly parts of the frontal lobe are disproportionately large in humans, but there's also lots here in temporal and parietal cortex. Very occipital parts and parts right in here uh, are more similar. Very roughly, this corresponds to some primary sensory regions of the brain, like primary motor and primary somatosensory cortex is up here, and that doesn't need to change in size too much from monkeys to humans. But then next to it, these red regions are association cortices that are not just a primary sensory cortex, but they do more complicated things. They integrate different sensory modalities, they store memories about the world, in the case of the frontal lobe, they plan things and make decisions about the future. So to some extent, uh, and without going into too much detail, one can tell a story about what it is about human cognition, what it is that we can do in our thinking and in our behavior that distinguishes us from monkeys and map that to the function of the corresponding brain regions that have expanded. Um, there's a lot of history to this, and your book has some history here, uh, where uh, people who were into phrenology um, thought that it was possible indeed to assign functions very specifically to certain parts in the brain. Um, and they thought, moreover, that you could figure out how, um, uh, how good a person was with, at this particular function by simply feeling their skull and that there would be a bump in the skull if they had a lot of whatever this thing is, um, ideality or something like that. Um, so the phrenologists were right that there is, to some extent, um, uh, functional localization in the brain. Different parts of the brain do different things. They were quite wrong in thinking that these functions are assigned to one place in the brain. They're not. Function, the relationship between cognitive functions and places in the brain is much more distributed. They're probably networks, different parts of the brain that all work together as a system, not just one place. And they were also wrong about the kinds of cognitive functions that you can map at all onto these brain networks in the first place. It's not ideality and sublimity and whatever these things mean, uh, but uh, other kinds of cognitive processes like working memory, attention, object recognition, etc. So let's take a very quick look at where these are in the brain in a very cursory level. So we'll first walk our way through the frontal lobe. So remember this red line here is the central sulcus, which partitions the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe, and this uh, gyrus immediately in front of the central sulcus. So the most posterior part of frontal cortex is primary motor cortex. So this has to do with being able to move uh, parts of your body, and there is an orderly relationship between which, where anatomically uh, certain parts of your body are represented. So for instance, if you electrically stimulate in one part of motor cortex up here, you will elicit movements in one particular part of the body. If you go to a different part, it's a different part of the body. So there is a topographic relationship that is a mapping on, of the anatomy of the tissue, the spatial adjacency of neurons in this primary motor cortex, and the body parts that they're innervate, that, that they innervate. There's pictures of that uh, in your book, and you'll see more pictures where we talk about motor and somatosensory cortex. What happens then is, and this is a very common theme, is that you have a primary cortex like this, that the tissue next to it does stuff that's kind of similar, because it's close by and uh, intimately connected with this region. Um, and then you have sort of layers, to some extent a hierarchy, of different kinds of processing. So let me, sh let me illustrate what I mean. So this motor cortex is responsible for moving parts of your body. In front of that, you have premotor or supplementary motor cortex, frontal eye fields, and other regions. And what these are involved in is not directly moving parts of your body, but planning to move parts of your body, or forming goals to move parts of your body, or forming a long-term sort of abstract decision to execute some kind of behavior. So you get more and more abstract representations that all have to do with movement, but uh, they get more abstract and less directly coupled to the actual movement. So here in this very frontal part, for instance, you could form a plan, a decision, to do some action. But it might take some time, it would depend on a certain context, etc. And this region could then 
influence these other regions and eventually motor cortex and you would do the action. For instance, if you electrically stimulate motor cortex, as I mentioned, you would move a part of your body. So if I, if I stimulate the region of motor cortex that topographically responds, corresponds to your hand, if I put a little electric current in there, you're going to move your hand. If I ask you what did that feel like, you will say, well, I just had this sudden, you know, my hand just moved. That's it. If I go further forward into supplementary motor cortex and would try and do the same kind of thing, you'll also move your hand. But if I ask you what happened, you will say, I suddenly had this really strong urge and really wanted to move my hand. So it's quite different. You have much more motivation, volition, um, and you can kind of see how it's decoupled to some extent from the actual movement. So motor cortex just implements the movement. These other regions are, have more abstract representations that are ultimately linked to the movement. There's some very special uh, parts of the brain linked to forming plans for certain kinds of movements in the human brain, only in the left hemisphere, and that's this area here. So you could think of this in a way as a very high-level sort of premotor cortex. And this is called Broca's area, and it is concerned with uh, planning the movements that result in speech. So it's part of your brain on the left side only, related to language processing. So again, if, so if you had a lesion here, you wouldn't be paralyzed in moving your mouth. You could still move your mouth and you know, do stuff. You could make grunts and, and so forth. But you would lack the neural machinery to plan those particular patterns of movements that would result in speech. Um, we'll take a quick look in the remaining five minutes here at uh, sensory cortices, and there's a, uh, a basic arrangement uh, whereby sensory modalities, all sensory modalities, eyes, vision, audition, somatosensation, gustation, all of these come into the brain, uh, but they don't directly project to cortex. So information doesn't directly go from the eyes to visual cortex. All of these project in various ways that are to some extent idiosyncratic, depending on the sensory modality, through the thalamus. This is a collection of nuclei, in pretty much in the middle of the brain. They all have to project there first, and then they project to their corresponding primary sensory cortices. So all sensory information has to first go through the thalamus, and then to the cortex. There's one exception to that, which is olfaction. So smell, to some extent, bypasses the thalamus. It also projects to the thalamus, but the thalamus is not an obligatory relay before it gets to cortex. It gets to primitive parts of cortex first. Uh, so this just says what I said. Let me finish by quickly covering the rest of the brain here. So we talked about the frontal lobe, which was concerned with movement, motor cortex. All this other stuff we're going to talk about in the back of the brain here is concerned with sensing things about the world. And so immediately at next to motor cortex, so here's the central sulcus. Motor cortex, remember, was just anterior to it in the front lobe. Immediately posterior to it, in the most anterior part of the parietal lobe, is somatosensory cortex. So this has to do with representing touch on the surface of your body. Like with motor cortex, it's topographic. If I stimulate in one location, you would feel touch on your toe. If I stimulate in another location, you would feel touch on your hand, etc. And there's an orderly relationship between where the neurons are on this sheet of tissue, on this gyrus, and where, they, where on the body they get their somatosensory information from. Just like with motor cortex, if we go to adjacent cortex, so just cortex adjacent to it, posterior here, in the parietal lobe, you will find that there's sort of higher level processing. So with motor cortex, it was processing relating to planning a movement. With somatosensory cortex, it's more higher level processing that has to do with representing higher level properties of touch, beginning to integrate touch with other, somatos with other sensory modalities like vision and so forth. So these are called association cortices and you would find neurons with more complex properties. They only respond to touch a brush in a certain direction on your skin. They only respond to vibration on your skin. They respond to vibration on your skin and also vision to some extent, and so forth. So these, these are all related to somatosensory processing. Visual processing is in the very back of your brain, occipital lobe, and primary occipital cortex, and we'll cover each of these modalities, so to some extent this is all a preview, 
We'll cover each of these in a lecture or more dedicated to them later in the course. But for vision, primary visual cortex is located in a sulcus here that you can only see from a sagittal view of the human brain. So here's a sagittal view. We've cut the human brain along the midline. If you're looking at the medial surface of the right hemisphere, here's the frontal lobe, here's the parietal lobe, and back here's the occipital lobe. Primary visual cortex is back there. Again, next to it are higher order visual cortices that process more complex things about vision. And finally, last one, in the temporal lobe, there are regions that are concerned with, whoops, sorry, with audition. So there are regions, there's a place up here, Heschel's gyrus and other gyri, again, we'll talk about them in a lot of detail in the lecture that you have in the auditory system, and these are concerned with audition. So to just quickly summarize, frontal lobe has to do in the posterior part with movement, motor cortex, and with planning movements and more abstract kinds of things that have to do with making decisions for what kinds of actions to take. Parietal lobe has to do with somatosensation, and again, as you go to more posterior association cortices, more complex aspects. Occipital lobe has to do with vision. Temporal lobe has to do with audition. This is a gross oversimplification. All of these regions do more, but uh, if you were asked where these sensory modalities are, primarily, are located, where the primary sensory cortices are, you would tell me that for hearing, it's in the temporal lobe, for vision, it's in the occipital lobe, for touch, it's in the parietal lobe, and for movement, it's in the frontal lobe. Um, this just mentions what I said. Um, one thing to know, uh, just to, as a preview, and again, you will see it again when we talk about all the different systems, is that the inputs and outputs, so where motor cortex neurons project on the body, where visual cortex or somatosensory cortex gets its input from, these are all contralaterally organized. So they all have to, all connected to the opposite part of the body to first order. So the left side of motor, motor cortex in your left hemisphere controls movements on the right part of your body. Um, somatosensory cortex in your left hemisphere represents touch on the right side of your body and so forth. So there's functional specialization in these different anatomical regions. These are just sort of basic common themes, which your book also goes into, into detail. There is some hemispheric asymmetry in function. Uh, the only one that we've mentioned and that you need to know about is language. So language is, tends to be lateralized to the left hemisphere. Not in everyone, but in most people it's lateralized to the left. There are a variety of functional and anatomical pathways that we'll talk about, about how information flows be between all these different areas. Uh, we haven't talked about this at, at all, but you will see when we go into the detailed systems that uh, it's not just sort of a feed-forward processing. Um, so it's not just that you get input to somatosensory cortex. Somatosensory cortex projects to the next cortex, then to the next cortex, to the next cortex. That does happen. There is this sort of hierarchical processing scheme that I mentioned, but all of these regions also project back down from regions where they got input from, and so they're in a position to modulate uh, processing at lower levels, for instance, by, on the basis of expectations that you might have of what you would uh, sense. So we're going to stop there, um, review these uh, uh, slides and the reading, and then we'll take a look at an actual human brain so you can take a look where all the different lobes and where all these different functional regions are located on an actual brain uh, in the discussion sections on tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so I know vision, like uh, visually sensation and touch, and I'm just wondering different parts of the brain. Uh, but this, this, sorry, give me one second. I want to make sure I save the video here.